Okay, so we're, um, I'm happy to be here today. This is a, um, an interesting topic. And as I was uh, mentioning to the, the coordinators here that uh, uh, I've been doing a series of these on different parts of the world where um, there are appreciable number of people who have immigrated from that area. And there are uh, lots of people in those areas, but there is very little uh, information about genealogical records in those areas. So I'm sort of giving you an introduction to an area that maybe isn't uh, as, uh, let's call it popular to research as other areas, but really has a lot of people that need assistance and uh, need to know about the records. Um, one mention here, we're at the date of this uh, particular class, we are uh, about to reopen the Brigham Young University Family History Center. We have, uh, this is June of 2021, and we've been out of uh, missionaries. We've been out of the Family History Center now for over a year. And uh, physically, we will be able to go back in and start serving on June 21st. So if you're going watching this early on, you'll uh, realize that we're back in the library. And if you're watching it sometime in the future, you may at least realize that uh, we were out of the library for a long period of time. Um, one of the things interesting about uh, Latin America and, uh, and talking about uh, anything having to do with Latin America is knowing what it is. We hear a lot of references in the United States to uh, Latin America and maybe it's just sort of a vague thing that you have down there in, in your uh, consciousness that uh, and don't really know about. I taught uh, Spanish for a number of years uh, at a community college, Maricopa County Community College District in, uh, in Mesa, Arizona. And the interesting thing about the class was one of the exercises right at the beginning of a beginning Spanish class was to uh, have the students at sort of memorize and pass that little test on, on uh, having a, a knowledge of each of the Latin American countries and the capital of each country. And uh, that was a challenge. It was really difficult for some people and uh, they just had never thought about uh, all the different countries that there were down there in Latin America. So basically, all the Spanish, English, and Portuguese speaking countries in North, Central, and South America and the Caribbean, including Mexico, are generally lumped together as Latin America, even though some of them speak other languages than Spanish. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of, a, of a different idea there. If you, uh, if you start to understand that there are some English speaking countries in Latin America, and there are also, uh, there's also of course Portuguese, which is a, a language that's very close to Spanish, but not Spanish spoken in Brazil primarily. So we have, uh, uh, when we start to understand this and we understand the scope and the size and the huge population of people that live down there, it's just really a, a shame that so little about Latin America is taught in American uh, schools. If you, uh, very few people would even know uh, the identity of the countries, but it, along with that, there would be very little knowledge of, of any of the history of this part of the world. So it's, it's, a, it's, very, uh, it's a very interesting thing to, to begin to understand and learn a lot about the history of this area. Um, so where is Central America? Now that's another question because uh, there's lots of interest and people realize that they're, uh, if you look at a map, it's pretty obvious. There's a little, it looks like a little uh, peninsula or, or a piece of land that sticks the two continents together between uh, uh, North America and South America. And in fact, it is quite narrow. At the, at the most narrow point down in Panama, it is only about 50 miles wide between the, between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, actually the Caribbean and uh, the Pacific Ocean. So what they are, uh, so what we have is a long narrow stretch. What is not obvious from most maps is the tremendous distances involved. Uh, 
and the size of these countries, they are not inconsequentially small. And the distances here are tremendous. Uh, thousands of miles south of the United States. And uh, it can be, uh, you know, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a very, when you start getting concept of the size and the, and the variety in the, of these countries, it becomes extremely interesting. Okay, so we're gonna keep going because we need to understand them. And there, in these, this is the list of the countries which are usually considered to be part of Central America. And there's a number of islands around, of course, and a lot of those are inhabited islands and they are, uh, they, they, uh, are usually claimed by a, one of the countries. The first one, of course, starting, we'll start in the north, uh, east of the, of the map and we'll go to Belize, uh, pronounced either Belize or Belize, but in Spanish it's Belize. And so that's my most common pronunciation for it. And then Guatemala, and then coming down uh, the map, there are two countries, uh, El Salvador and Honduras. And I'm going to say them in Spanish so you'll hear a little bit like maybe what it would sound like. And then Nicaragua, and then Panama. Oh, forgot Costa Rica. Costa Rica between Nicaragua and Panama. And uh, one of the questions that comes up occasionally is, could you theoretically drive all the way from the United States down to South America? Um, it comes up uh, with people who have a real kind of uh, adventurous twist. Well, what happens is that there is no road from North America to South America. And uh, it is very unlikely that a road will ever be made. Well, it's possible, but it's not likely that a road will be made for political and for geographical reasons. In Panama, the road ends. I have been to the end of the road. It ends at a river. And on the other side of the river is jungle. And from that point until you get down into um, uh, the, to the South America, it is solid jungle. And it is some of the most difficult jungle tread terrain. In fact, it wasn't until, oh, mid 1900s, like the 1950s and 60s before people began to attempt to do the land crossing. And uh, they mounted big expeditions and a couple of uh, like British and other expeditions were able to, to physically move their equipment across that, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that uh, they were able to do very well. And Usually what happens if, if someone does drive down the, the uh, very dangerous highway down through Central America, they, uh, they take a boat from Panama City down to Cartagena. Okay, well, so here we are in uh, looking at a number of different countries, and I'll talk about some of them in, in uh, specifics because they are significantly different than all of the other countries. Uh, just to point out as a contrast that Mexico is in North America, as are the Northern Caribbean islands. Uh, the Caribbean is uh, kind of divided up into different countries that claim it and some independent countries. Obviously there are independent countries like Cuba and Haiti and the Dominican Republic, but there are also uh, things like American um, the American claims to Puerto Rico, and then you have the, Bahama, the Bahamas that are claimed by uh, Great Britain. So there's just different places there, depending on which island you're talking about, as to who, uh, which country may actually be um, in charge. And the Dominic and the uh, the islands out there, all of those Caribbean islands, each have. Uh, there, there's a great difference in the cultures and there's a tremendous, and some difference in the languages spoken in those countries. So uh, some speaks French, some speak Spanish and some speak English. And so there's just a, uh, there's a lot of differences and there's hardly the same kind of, of, uh, of homogeny in, in uh, Central America. When we start thinking about doing uh, genealogical research, and particularly in an area that we may not be that familiar with, 
we have uh, four main challenges. The four main challenges are the language spoken, the handwriting, the availability of the records, and the condition of the records. Uh, language is, uh, is the second you step out of English and go into, in this case, Spanish, uh, you have a whole, uh, uh, that's it's a set of information that you have to learn and become familiar with in order to do uh, research. You can only do so far doing your research in a Spanish speaking country using English. You'll even find out you run out of, of uh, websites and other things that translate everything into, into English very quickly. And almost uh, uniformly, everything you find will be in Spanish. Um, and that goes for most of the other countries of the world that have their own, partic their own particular languages. Uh, obviously, from looking at a record like this, you'll, you'll see that uh, uh, handwriting is always a, uh, a challenge. Uh, there are some, and I'll talk about some ways to uh, get it, to begin to learn enough to do the various things that you need to do uh, here in with handwriting. Availability is a, a key factor when you start going to countries uh, like those in Central America. Uh, there have never, uh, th none of those countries have had uh, a very stable government. Uh, they all have their, have had their difficulties and uh, there's a lot of challenges and poverty is one of the, the big challenges in all of the countries. And so the fact that they have records and that they have been preserved uh, is, is, is quite extraordinary and uh, there are there are significant records and preserved records in these, in these particular countries. And as I will point out, uh, most of those records that we would have available to us, uh, short of, of making a trip to those countries or uh, making an, a, a big effort to contact people down there in the country would be uh, basically available on FamilySearch, familysearch.org and Family Search, the organization has, is the one that has made the, the biggest effort to acquire uh, Central American records. So those records that are readily available are readily available on, on the Family Search uh, with one risk, with one kind of condition. The condition is that some of those records may be restricted at this time. They may be only visible, only accessible in a family history center or a family history library. And during that time period, uh, for, for, many, uh, for many reasons, that may be also, that will, restriction will continue. It has nothing at all to do with the pandemic that we had uh, the one year of, of more than a year of pandemic that may continue to go on because not all of these countries, by the way, are out of the pandemic. And so um, there's some differing abilities. But those, abil those restricted records have to do with agreements between Family Search and the, and the uh, originators, the, the, the countries where those records came from. And if you run into a restricted record, you're going to need to uh, access that record through a family history center. Now, as we return to family history centers, uh, because we are in the family history center, there will be limited ability for us to access some of those records. But right now, Family Search has uh, a, a link on the family history library, the Salt Lake City Family History Library website, which is part of familysearch.org, to uh, for for people to make requests to uh, gain access to, to some, not all, but some of the restricted records. And so uh, there is a pathway there for people to, to get um, access to these records. So availability can be uh, the, a, a major challenge in doing research in any country, even in the United States, by the way, there's some records that are not easily available. Uh, we have uh, literally billions of records, I mean, with a B, billions of records sitting in the, in the, in the U.S. National Archives, which have never been, uh, which are not accessible except in the archives. Uh, so that's not unusual that we find those kinds of limitations and the fact and very small percentage of those records have been and are being digitized and made available to the public. So 
another important thing is when you look at the record like this is the condition of the record. Obviously this record's not in very condition and it seems like there's a rule out there that if you're looking for a specific piece of information about an ancestor, it may be that it seems like every time you do that, the record you need is either missing or has been somehow lost or destroyed and uh, is the one on the edge of the page is the name or what you need is right there where the record has disappeared. But uh, that's sort of uh, the, uh, it's, a not, it, it's, it's, a, it's a standard problem across all records in all countries. And we just basically uh, have to live with the fact that some of the information that we think is absolutely essential is not available or, or could be available. Now there might be alternative records and that's part of the game and part of the, the process of learning to be uh, a, a good research genealogist is understanding how many different uh, places you might be able to look for the same information. Do you speak Spanish? Se habla español? Uh, the answer may be no, uh, but the answer for doing uh, genealogical research is that you can learn genealogical terms. If you spend a little bit of time with a word list or using Google Translate, you should be able to, uh, to pick up uh, most of the terms that you need. Uh, if the documents get long, like uh, some of the documents in Spanish that go on for pages, then you, you may need to, to help get some help from some experts or someone who speaks Spanish. But uh, in most cases, you can get along, uh, at least for some research, with uh, learning the genealogical terms. But I would always say that it helps to know Spanish and it helps to know uh, any of the other languages to some extent when you begin research in, a, in that country. Now, if you have difficulty on one of those, which is the handwriting, and uh, that can become a, a great challenge and, and uh, you think that's not a challenge, uh, just uh, and you, uh, depending on your age and uh, your schooling, you may or may not be comfortable reading um, uh, handwriting script. And so this is, a, this is a, going to become a more, a more prevalent, prevalent, prevalent uh, challenge in the future because as people begin to, um, as the young people today who are not taught, taught how to read or how to write handwriting very intensively, they will get to the point where they can't read the handwriting very easily. And when they move into handwriting systems in uh, going back in the past, they just become a greater and greater challenge. That's not to say that even if you are very proficient with your handwriting and have uh, a beautiful hand, it's, uh, it's still a challenge. And that happens uh, systematically as you go back in time. The further you go back in time, the more difficult the handwriting is. Now, what we're looking at here is the BYU script tutorial, and there are a number of, you can see the countries listed there on the screen, uh, and Spanish is one of those countries, uh, one of those languages, I, excuse me, and English, and uh, you can either take the uh, Spanish documents instruction in English or Spanish, and uh, in this case, you can learn to read, uh, read some of the older handwriting. You may also wish to, uh, if you take any romantic romantic language like French or Italian or any of those other languages, you also may want to learn how to read Latin documents because as you go back in time in the uh, Catholic church records, you will find out that uh, uh, a lot of the information in those records is in Latin rather than in, in Spanish. So this is a very, uh, it's very helpful to know that. Um, the condition of the records, you can't really, um, you know, it's it, once this happens, it's, uh, it's, there's nothing more that you can do with it other than in the preservation area, you can put this, these records in for preservation and stop any stop or slow down, greatly slow down, slow down any further deterioration. But obviously the way to preserve the information that is actually made uh, actually contained in these records 
is through digitizing the records and family search and, and the other large online genealogical websites have um, a systematic and very, and very uh, uh, extensive digitization projects. So they are digitizing millions and millions of records a year and making a good headway. A family search has made over the last 10 years or so has made extensive headway in digitizing records in Central America. Uh, it used to be uh, 10, 15 years ago, if someone came in looking for records in Guatemala or, or Honduras or someone or someplace, they would be, I, it would be saying, well, yeah, go down there and find them, take a trip. But it, now it, it's very possible that some of the, some of the more essential records will be online and available on Family Search. Oh, by the way, this particular record is readable. Um, we were, this is a record from when uh, my wife and I were digitizing records at the Maryland State Archives. And this is sort of the uh, example of some of the records that we were handling and, and digitizing. But on this particular record, uh, by blowing it up and on the digital copy, I was able to read all of the essential information. So sometimes so if it's captured on film, uh, on uh, digital images, uh, you can reconstruct a lot of that information. Now, always, always, and this is a, a basic rule, is before you start looking for ancestors in any particular country, learn the history of your ancestral country. If you're going to do research in Sweden or in Denmark or in Norway or in Germany or in Italy or Spain or on Central America or South America, wherever you're going, China, uh, Russia, wherever it is your ancestors end up coming from, I would suggest very, very strongly that you learn a significant amount of history of the country. Now, one of the things that you may have picked up over the years and in your view of Central America is uh, bananas and uh, poverty. And uh, you may think of uh, pictures of all the pictures of the beaches and, uh, and some of the in, uh, some of the, uh, the indigenous ruins and, and things like that. Um, but uh, you might be surprised. And uh, this picture of, of uh, is one of the surprises. Uh, anyone want, to, I, I can't really poll everybody out there, but uh, I would usually ask a class to say, okay, tell me where this picture came from. And uh, you might be surprised. This happens to be Panama City, Panama, at the mouth of the canal, of the Panama Canal. So kind of interesting. Uh, you might want to compare that to uh, uh, um, where we happen to be here in Provo, Utah, as far as uh, is what you would call uh, development. Now let's go back and I'm just gonna to touch sort of generally on some of the history here uh, in Latin America. One of the things that uh, were, one of the subjects that were required for my degree in Spanish was to take a significant number of classes in, in, uh, in Spanish and Latin American history. So I ended up learning a lot about Spain and a lot about Latin America. And then um, ended up in, uh, as I mentioned, in Panama, living in Panama. Well, I may have not mentioned that, but I lived in Panama for two years as a in, in, uh, military intelligence officer for the United States Army. And so uh, I was, my first year was uh, dedicated to learning everything that I could possibly know about uh, Central America. So because of that kind of historical background, it became, an, it, it really is something that is, is immensely helpful in doing uh, land. You don't need that kind of much history, but you do need to know some basic concepts of what happened and why, because that everything that happened affects the records and the records and the preservation of the records and why the records are kept and where they might be and how they're, how you can access them. So all of this has is inter, intertwined with the uh, with the history of these particular countries. So these dates are important. So when you think about the date, like 
Columbus and 1492, you have to understand that those dates reflect exactly when records could or may have been created and to the extent to which those records were created. Uh, unfortunately, the written history of Central America was destroyed systematically by the, uh, the Spanish conquest when uh, beginning in 1492, when uh, the Spanish empire beginning began to expand into uh, Central America and into North America, they, um, uh, the Catholic church primarily systematically destroyed the written records of the people. Um, and then to add insult to injury, uh, began claiming that the Indians, uh, the ancestral Indian people, uh, native, native, you call them Native American, Native Central American people, uh, never had a writing system. Well, they did, and they did have paper, and they did have paper books, and they were burned. So it was kind of a, it's kind of an interesting um, situation in history. Um, except, okay, so from 1609, you know, think of 1492. Um, and there was a, a period of time uh, that we would call the conquest time when uh, the, Spanish em the Spanish empire was extending into these countries. And so it was a, a, a process of coming in and, uh, instead of, and working through all during the 1500s, there was a almost constant expansion and warfare going on. Until it was until there were most of the countries were were pretty well most of the areas were were dominated by by the the Spanish government the the royal government of Spain so from 1629 approximately and except for two countries Belize and Panama the Central America was ruled by the vice royalty of New Spain from Mexico City. Okay, so all of this area um, was called the vice relative of, of New Spain. And uh, then down south, there was another one in South, south America, the vice royalty of Nueva Granada. And all of that uh, connections of those of the countries along any along the west coast uh, went and had to cross either through Mexico or through the peninsula of uh, Panama. So it was uh, this little area of Panama that became the crossroads for all of this to travel back and forth. Now, the advantage now for, for, um, re for researchers back is that beginning in the 1500s with the Catholic church records, there are uh, sets of records in, in a lot of these countries that go back systematically back through the Catholic Church records back to the 1500s. And so research, uh, assuming you have access to and can locate the records, and they're not, for those that on family search, obviously you can do that. But uh, those records are, uh, are tremendous for doing research because they, they show uh, huge amounts of information about the families. Okay, so now let's see, there's something very interesting here. And this is, um, this is something that happened um, because of the way that Spain was organized and because um, the Catholic church was the state church of, uh, of Spain. Then uh, what happened is that uh, there was a way, the way they had of, of uh, of finding out about the population and maintaining their the governing uh, governance of all of these uh, various areas of, that later split up into individual countries was to uh, require records. And they required, uh, the Catholic Church usually required uh, multiple copies of the records. Now, generally speaking, in, in, in uh, Spanish speaking countries and Catholic countries, there are two levels of records. They have a per, a parish registers, which are the uh, smallest subdivision, geographic subdivision of the Catholic church, the parishes. And the parish registers were, were kept by the priests and they record primarily 
uh, birth, uh, not birth, but uh, christenings, which usually happen sometime near birth, but not always. And then uh, records of confirmations of the of the Catholics who obtained uh, from 14 to 16 to 18 years of age, who uh, went through the catechism and became real Catholics. And then uh, there were marriage records and there's a, some variety in the types of marriage records that are available because uh, sometimes people needed to marry their cousins because they were the only people to marry. And to do that, they had to go through a long process of getting a dispensation to marry their cousins. And so they created records on the diocese level. And so we have, oh, and we have burial records. And very, so there are two things missing primarily, and those are birth records and death records. And so if you're starting to get frustrated because you can't find a birth record in Latin America, uh, you get used to it kind of a problem because the, uh, the only record that's going to be made is the burial record or the uh, baptismal record. And uh, it wasn't until the mid 1800s that we've got other kinds of records. And we'll talk about this. Now we're gonna look at the, the general archive of the Indies. And I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, I mentioned there were two records that were being created, uh, the parish registers and the diocese records. In most of the Latin, in most of the uh, empire, the Spain required a third copy of the records. And uh, so what was happening in the vice royalty of, of, Mex of uh, Spain uh, headquartered in Mexico City is the records were being sent to Mexico City and then another copy of the records was being sent to Spain. So essentially there was a backup copy of the records in Spain and they are sitting in this, what is called the Archivo General de los Indies, de la India. And it came to uh, begin in 1785, pretty late, but that was when they began gathering the records. So the records basically go back further in time, but then they were collected in, into, uh, into a single place in Seville. And the, 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 now the, the archive uh, of, the Indie, of the Indies has over 43,000 documents and 80 million pages of original papers. So documents and pages are different and there are eight linear kilometers, that's roughly around four miles of shelving, maybe a little less than four miles of shelving. But that's this huge database. And a lot of that is being digitized. And where it's being digitized is the portal of Spanish archives, Pares. And uh, there's the address. Now this brings up an interesting problem with these uh, classes. Previously, we were not uh, recording the classes. And now they are being recorded because we have a different system um, that was not restricted and that is not restricted. And these classes are uh, being uploaded to the BYU Family History Library web, uh, YouTube channel on YouTube and also put on the BYU uh, web, uh, Family History Library website. So these records, now you can go back and, and review these records and see about these, um, these addresses of the various locations. Now, important thing about a class like this is not that you can find a, a URL to a particular register, but I would hope that the, the purpose of the class would be to have uh, you aware that there was a place to look for the records. Okay, so that's uh, once you get into that. And then when you know these places to start looking, then you just can use Google uh, to research and find uh, the archives if, uh, if they're available. So that's, that's basically the way that we get this to work. Now, looking at it in, this, in a class like this that is, um, fairly short. Each country has a complex history dating back even to well before the Spanish conquest, thousands of years into the past, um, tens of thousands of years into the past in some cases. And so there is just a tremendous history back there. Now the, the good news is that it's a, it's a very interesting 
And, the, and kind of if from the standpoint of the bad news is it doesn't really do a whole lot of good for genealogy because the records are not detailed in, in a lot of, in most cases, detailed enough to identify individuals, um, especially not in lineage form and knowing who, who you might be descended from. So um, it, it is effectively, not completely, but effectively, you may end up finding out that you're, you're in your um, uh, genealogy is going back in these countries ends uh, with your either your ancestors coming from some other country to Latin America or finding out that they were uh, that before they were they were speaking another language they were speaking an indigenous language and uh, their records are not are no longer available. Okay, now I said there were a couple of, of uh, sort of uh, exceptions to the rule, and Belize is a, an exception to the word. Belize is an exception to the, word, the rule. Here was a, a small area of what otherwise would be either Mexico or Guatemala, and it was claimed by uh, Great Britain. And uh, so it became, uh, in a sense, a British colony. And then so in 1836, when uh, Central America was emancipated from Spanish rule, uh, the British claimed the right to this region and uh, they declared that it a British crown colony uh, subordinate to Jamaica, which would be in, in Spanish would be Jamaica and named it a British, on, British Honduras. So if you go back in time history wise, you'll find a country called British Honduras and British Honduras is really now the country of Belize or Belize. So you'd have uh, the, the old British Honduras. If any, if any of you out there, there are very few of us now, but if there are anybody out there who collects stamps, uh, philatelists, and uh, uh, I have a tremendously complex and very extensive stamp collection that I accumulated back two generations. So it's, uh, you know, and it's fairly, uh, it's fairly big. But one of the things that had helped me when I was young is I learned the names of all the countries of the world. And since that, they've all changed. Now they haven't all changed, but significant numbers of them have changed. Like British Honduras, which I obviously knew where that was, but now it's not called British Honduras. So you have to kind of uh, uh, make that adjustment. So, okay, so the records of British Honduras, where are they going to be? They're in Great Britain. So in this particular country, you may be doing research in uh, in English records in in uh, from English in great in in Great Britain, and uh, either in the National Archives in in uh, uh, in the Eng in the National Archives in in England or in uh, records that are from England, um, and to, some of them may or actually be digitized. So this would be a, a sort of a departure from any of the other records that you may be looking for. The other big dispute, the difference is Panama. Panama was, uh, has a very, uh, very interesting history. Uh, it's one of the more interesting things in history that you can read about is the uh, construction of the Panama Canal. Uh, Panama was part of Colombia and it was claimed by Colombia forever, but uh, during the time when uh, the major countries of, of the world, France for particular, and the United States, and specifically, also specifically the United States, became interested in, in constructing a uh, canal. And uh, a man by the name of Delepas, Delepas, um, Delepas, I don't know how to say it without thinking Spanish, so it's not going to come out right no matter what I say. But anyway, a Frenchman built the Suez Canal and then uh, attempted to build a canal across Panama, which he did not do and did not finish. The United States came in and through a few political maneuverings managed to declare Panama independent by essentially, uh, well, I have to say it, buying out the, uh, the people in Panama who wanted to be independent. And so they uh, then agreed to give the United States a, a section across the country from north to south, by the way, 
the canal runs north and south, not east and west. And, um, and then they began the process of, of, the United States began the process of building the Pan Panama Canal. But Panama then uh, became an independent country, a uh, long history of independence, basically, uh, that's uh, just not too long ago in the past. Uh, the United States ceded back all of the canal zone to Panama, and now Panama uh, owns the canal. There were always dire predictions that the canal had collapsed and whatever. However, Panama, since that time, has built a second canal next to the, the original canal and now has more, uh, as, as greater amount of traffic going through. Um, so from 1902 to 1914, that, uh, that whole process of building the canal. So when you do, if you have Panamanian ancestors, you may have uh, ancestors who, who date back to the original Indians. You may have some uh, African-American uh, people who were brought in from the Caribbean to work in the canal. You may have English speaking people. You may have people from any place in the world that, that, may, that may have settled in Panama. So this is why they're a little bit different, those two countries. What is the key to Central American research? It's pretty straightforward at this point. Identify the parish church or town where your ancestors lived. That's the first thing you have to do. Um, and this is a picture of Costa Rica, by the way. This is uh, um, uh, one of the volcanoes in Costa Rica. But Arenal. And so the, uh, you can identify, uh, the, when we're talking about the parish church, we, I mean it, uh, that means you, you have to identify the exact place where, you're, where at least one event occurred in an ancestor's life. And then that's the key to opening up the whole, um, uh, the whole pedigree, whole history of, uh, of your ancestors in any of one of the Latin American Spanish speaking countries and Spain and Italy and every other Catholic country uh, that, uh, that has had a predominant uh, Catholic uh, religion for a thousand years. The reason why that is is because uh, the Spanish were not very original in naming everyone. Um, and uh, it, it, it's even in some cases even more difficult uh, than, uh, than the uh, names as they go back in uh, Scandinavia and some of the other countries, in England, for example. And uh, the original records, if you go back far enough, when the, uh, when the uh, conquistadores, the conquestors, the, the, the Spanish empire was expanding, uh, the Catholic church baptized everybody. In other words, they killed them or they baptized them centrally. But they, um, uh, basically what happened was that they gave the same names to everybody because they didn't, uh, weren't going to use what they called pagan names from the Indians. And so they uh, gave everybody a new name and the new names they gave were all the same. They gave everybody almost, and you'll find whole parish registers if you go back far enough where every single entry, the person's name is Jose, the male's name is Jose and the female's name is Maria. And it's, uh, it's amazing, but also at that point, you're um, kind of out of luck at finding any more information about who, uh, which of all those people happen to be your ancestor. That goes back in the 1500s, by the way, we're not talking about something that happened recently. This is clear back uh, uh, hundreds of years. And uh, uh, you can basically use the records, the subsequent records to find uh, ancestors back that far uh, depending on which part of the, the different countries you have records for and so forth. So what are the three main types of records? Well, first of all, I've mentioned parish registers, and those include uh, the copies made for the diocese, which are the groups of parishes. Uh, uh, the parishes were, were um, uh, directed by a priest. The diocese had a bishop. And then there's archdiocese, which cover the whole countries, and they were organized by an archbishop. So then you have civil registration records, which I mentioned uh, originated about in the 1800s. You would, in the mid 1800s, you would, uh, for each of the countries, 
uh, you would think of these as Napoleonic records. They're records that were um, that began to be kept across Europe and around the world. In the United States, we call them vital records, uh, birth, death, and marriage records. Um, and uh, in those countries, the civil registration records uh, are more useful than the census records. In most of these countries, census records, if they exist, may only have counted the number of people and not given any names. So there are some censuses out there and they're kind of worth looking for. And some of them may be helpful. The more recent ones would be more, more helpful. But basically you're looking at two, two main kinds of records. Now there's lots of other records. There's land records, there's, there's uh, police records, there's military records, there's all sorts of records out there. But uh, the uh, accessibility and the uh, uh, availability of those records is, is somewhat limited. And the simplest thing, the way to get started, of course, if you have uh, Latin American ancestors is to start talking to your oldest, the oldest living relatives you have. And that's a time thing, because if your family um, immigrated to another country, uh, then it's very possible that the uh, knowledge of the original origin, the, or, the origin of the, of the original family uh, was uh, has been lost, but it might take some, uh, some more research. And that's really the, the crucial point is determining the, or, the or, original area. Once you do that, you'll find out that there is very little movement, if any, of the people from one area to another. That begins in the late 1800s and into the 1900s. So uh, once you get back a ways, you're pretty well set as to which record set you can use. Look in the catalog on finallysearch.org in, uh, in the website by country. Uh, start out, put in the country name, and that will give you a list of the various categories of records that are available, and then you can further refine that by looking for places within the country, which usually, uh, there are usually the, the uh, civil districts uh, and sometimes the parishes, and occasionally even a diocese or two thrown in. So you just need to be, start looking at the, the maps and geography and figure out where all these people lived. Family Search does have um, country pages uh, when you go to look at the families uh, under the search, you see the records, which is the first selection under the search tab on family search. You'll find that uh, there are digitized records here and uh, indexed to some extent, not completely. Some of them are not completely indexed, but uh, they do have it on, on, uh, a, uh, a family page for each, I mean, excuse me, a country page for each country in the world where they have records. So here you can look for Nicaragua, you click on a map, there's an interactive map, you click, it gives you a drop down menu of the area. If you click on Central America, you'll have a selection of all of the countries. You can click in this case on Nicaragua, and then you would have um, the name of, you'd have a list of all the records. Now, quickly to understand the records on family search, there are three major kinds of records. Those records that are found in the historical record collections, the ones that are available under the tab up there that says records in green. Um, those records are um, to the most point, the object of, of uh, they've been digitized and they're the object of being indexed. Uh, like I said, not all the indexes are complete, but there are usually indexes for the records in that collection. The next set of records are in the catalog and the catalog lists all the records on family search except the images. And the catalog lists those records that are both indexed and not indexed. And, it, and so you find a, a significantly large portion of all the records on family search that are unindexed and they're in the catalog. Now there's a third set of records and those are called images and that's the second option there. In the, in the menu at the top of the screen. And images are, are just that. There are the images that have been digitized from the records. And what you will find, as I have found time and again, 
that these are records that are not in the catalog and they are not indexed. And so the only way you can look is to look down through a list geographically, a list of where those records are and uh, begin looking page by page, year by year. They're usually broken down into the batches that were digitized by whoever's doing the digitization in that particular country. So in, if you're looking in Nicaragua, you would find the Nicaragua records that were currently being digitized. And you may find out that there are thousands or hundreds of thousands or even more records in that category because they're digitizing the records and tremendously faster than they can uh, index them or catalog them. So there's three really places you'll always look on family search for records if, if you don't find what you, if you don't find it by looking for a name, you need to go to the catalog and start looking geographically. And then if you don't find it and the records in the catalog, you still need to go to the images and again, look geographically and see if you can find the records starting with the country. Okay, so then you can also look up the individual countries in the family search research wiki, where there are more extensive dis, uh, issue. They basically will tell you how the country is organized and have an interactive map, and also give you a list of records that are uh, available or could be available from that particular country. If it's in red, it probably means that none of those records are, are currently available of uh, two family search. So this gives you a kind of a way to look at quickly what kinds of records you can search in any of one of the countries. This, these go for all the countries of the world, not just the countries in Central America. Family History Guide, the fhguide.com, has the country section and does have um, instructions on how to do research in each of the Latin American countries. So if you go here first, you may get uh, some, you'll get some really good articles or videos or whatever, giving you overviews uh, of each of the countries and where the records can be set, uh, located, and what kinds of records you're going to find in, the, in those particular countries. Okay, so here we are. Also, you might want to know that there are archives. Um, this is kind of a diff difficult area in, Latin, in Central America uh, because of the political situations and uh, the difficulties of the countries. You may find that, uh, that contacting the archives may or may not be helpful. Uh, they may be able to help you find uh, some additional records, but they may also be, um, let's say less than cooperative, or they may not even have the records or they may not even be available. So you just, it's just depending on the time period, depending on the, on the thing, but you need to be aware always to go to libraries and archives within the countries. Now, uh, so that's, it's, it's a very important type of thing to research. Uh, so, make sure you explore each of the countries individually as you do your research, regardless of where your country came from. This, the background here is a, is a handmade document called AMOLA, M-O-L-A, MOLA, and they are made by the uh, Indians who live in the San Blas Islands on the north coast of Panama. And uh, they are, uh, extremely colorful and uh, very imaginative and uh, were our collector's items. And uh, for uh, if you go to some kinds of museums that have Latin American uh, background, you may find one of these framed as a, uh, in, as a uh, it, something for sale. But on the other hand, an original one is going to be extremely expensive. Okay, well, thanks for watching. We're uh, glad you were able to come and uh, to the class today and hopefully you learned something about Central America. <laughs>